Go see there the tender mercies of Great Britain. In that church you may find men, both still alive, hacked out of the very semblance of humanity. Some deprived of their arms, some with one arm or leg, and some with both legs cut off. Is not this cruelty a parallel to the history of our Scottish fathers? The nature of the conflict in the back country was really pretty brutal. It was almost a continual cycle of escalation of violence. I trace it to starting with what Tarleton did at the Waxhaws. So it was a bloody mess. And that sent a shockwave through the back country. The Presbyterians here were a very tight-knit community. They had never seen that kind of carnage before. That certainly was a wake-up call to folks in the back country. It was a massacre. It certainly was perceived that way by the back country. When it came to the revolution, certainly in 1775, 76, you have people in the back country who are basically apathetic, neutral. A few are imbued by the spirit of 76, but a lot of these, these men were small farmers. They just really wanted to be left alone. You've got a lot of backcountry men saying, why should we worry about what King George is doing? You worry about no taxation without representation. We can say the same thing. We have no representation in Charleston. They didn't think that the complaints of the legislators and the ruling elite in Charleston was really their fight. Then the British decide that they want to move against the southern colonies. Because the British had really counted on the fact that once we take South Carolina, there are going to be thousands of men who are going to flock to the King's Manor and fight for us. A number of the lowland Scots who came here by way of the Ulster Plantation in Northern Ireland had been severely handled by the English authorities in Ulster. In one of the Reverend William Martin's sermons at Rocky Creek, he talks about why they had to fight. He said, isn't this the same kind of issue that our forefathers dealt with in Scotland? The influence of the clergy is really pretty important. When these folks are, are preaching rebellion from the pulpit, their congregations are gonna listen. My heroes, talk and angry words will do no good. We must fight. In the current controversy between the United Colonies and the mother country, I have concluded that the Americans have been forced into the Declaration of Independence. Our forefathers in Scotland made a similar one and maintained that declaration with their lives. It is now our turn, brethren, to maintain this at all hazards. But people really think the war is over in South Carolina in 1780 after the fall of Charleston. The other American posts surrender. In London, there's a great celebration about the capture of that incredibly valuable colony of South Carolina. And then within six weeks, it all starts to unravel. And it begins to unravel in the back country in the New Acquisition District. When it came down to fighting in 1780 and 81, the British would complain. The best men are on the other side. He was about five feet, five uh, tall, uh, thin, wiry man, uh, but he was apparently a good leader. Bratton and many of his neighbors took an early and active role in the Revolutionary War. Like many Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, they were Whigs. They uh, believed in the cause of independence. Colonel Bratton was a captain during the Snow Campaign of 1775, the Cherokee Campaign of 1776, participated in most of the early campaigns of the war. But again, it was Patriot militia against Loyalist militia. No regular troops were involved. First of all, Huck was a despised character. The back country, if they had anybody that wanted to paint a target on it, would have been Huck. Christian Huck was a German. We know that when the war began in 1775, he was living in Philadelphia. But we also know that he was a loyalist and men like Christian Huck and many of his friends were branded as traitors. Their property was confiscated and they were basically driven out of town on a rail. So he came into the upcountry with a very distinctive attitude. Huck was profane. Uh, he was known as the swearing captain. 
frequently used the Lord's name in vain, which to these old-fashioned Presbyterians was just absolutely beyond the pale. Huck was transferred to the British Legion under Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton and given command of a troop of cavalry. So he began sending these men out on patrols to try to disperse these rebels who were still in arms. And their idea was to use force and intimidation to make people be loyal citizens. They ended up getting beaten by backcountry militiamen at the Battle of Williamson's Plantation, which we refer to more popularly as the Battle of Huck's Defeat. Instead of being frightened and dispersed, things are going the opposite direction. The rebels are getting stronger, they're getting better organized, they're recruiting more men. So once again, Colonel Turnbull sends Captain Huck out to disperse the rebels. Mrs. Bratton, she gets tipped off that the British are coming. She sends their African-American slave, Watt, with a message on horseback to go find her husband in camp and warn him that Huck's men are on the way. The loyalists in the New York Volunteers show up. Martha is threatened with a reaping hook. They interrogate her. She refuses. Captain Huck shows up. And then he proceeds about 300 yards due east of here and he makes camp at the plantation of a Bratton neighbor named James Williamson. The night was fairly well lit. There had been a, the moon had been about three quarters full for most of the night. There was also a very bright aurora borealis in the sky. They split the group into two main detachments. The men from York County uh, under Bratton would attack from the west side of the lane. The men from Chester County under McClure, uh, Lacey, and some other officers would attack from the east end. There were a couple of sentinels and they were asleep. So the Whigs posted guards over them with orders that if these guys wake up, you're to shoot them. Captain Huck had actually spent the night in the house with the Williamson family. True to form, although the Williamsons had hosted him that night, and had fixed breakfast in the morning. He rewarded them by cursing and threatening that all their sons would be killed if they didn't come in and surrender and join the Loyalist militia. James Williamson led the family in a prayer and prayed for the destruction of Captain Huck. And at that time, Huck really lost his temper. Huck said, that they had run all the regulars out of South Carolina, meaning the Continentals, and that even if it rained militia from the heavens, he would not value them. So he wasn't afraid of the militia. And at that point, the first shots of the battle rang out. The Whigs raised the war cry and attacked the Loyalist camp. Well, the Loyalists certainly were not expecting to be attacked at, at six o'clock in the morning. So it was bedlam. Men began running in all directions. A lot of them abandoned their horses and their equipment and headed for the woods. The Loyalist militia very quickly dispersed, fled, were killed or wounded. Their officers deserted them. Huck grabbed his sword and probably his hat and ran outside to see what was happening. The women shut the door and barricaded it so that he couldn't get back in the house meaning that he had left his green dragoon jacket inside the house. So at that point, he began shouting orders to his men to form up and began to storm and rave, cursing the Whig militia. If you damn rebels don't surrender, you'll all be put to the sword. Well, the New York volunteers were in a difficult situation because they had no room to maneuver. They're trained in the infantry bayonet charge. The Whigs are using the split rail fence along the lane as cover. So these guys are cut off and the Whigs are right on top of them before they knew what was happening. Huck tried to rally his men and lead them in a couple of cavalry charges, but the Whigs remained hidden behind Williamson's peach trees and apple trees. They were not gonna come out and stand in the open and be cut down like the Continental soldiers at the Battle of the Waxhaws had been. They knew better than that. 
At this point, Captain Huck seems to have decided that discretion was the better part of valor. So he and at least one or two of his other officers tried to make their way up Williamson's Lane. A group of militiamen took off after him, loading their rifles as they went. Huck went down and was dead when he hit the ground. Archaeology is the truth detector. History has interpretations. You cannot uninterpret or disinterpret or talk away the physical evidence of an artifact in its proper location. The actual location of the battle and how it unfolded was told by the history, but where exactly on the landscape that that battle took place, we did not know. Archaeology, history, and memory all play an interactive role. By just picking up anything, we were then able to map where the plantation house was based on a cloud of nails that were found right here. And just outside that was lead shot that had been melted where the British were, were making uh, lead balls uh, while they were camping here. Camping equipment like kettle fragments, British buckles, and that sort of thing were found here. Most of that we found was, again, this spray that came down this hill, culminating here at the final phase of the battle. But this was a tremendous victory for the Whigs in the backcountry. Unlike some of the earlier skirmishes, this was the first time that the Whig militia in the backcountry had engaged British provincial troops. So they are, quote, professional. This time, a shock wave went through the British command in the backcountry. Now the British were alarmed. Uh, this was kind of the reverse of Buford's massacre. The reason that people remember it is when the word went out that he was there, it didn't take long for Bratton and others to gather together and attack Huck at Williamson's plantation. Somebody who was a, a hated figure was not only defeated, he was killed. And this showed that, hey, you know, these militia boys just got their rifles together and took on this feared British legionnaire and whipped him. It also showed, as far as the Presbyterians were concerned, that God was on their side. That these profane British officers like Huck were uh, enemies of God. The revolution may have begun and ended in Charleston, but it was won in the backcountry. And this is where Huck's defeat is crucially important, not just to South Carolina history, but to American history. <laughs>